Hey guys, welcome back to the JP Podcast, episode 15. Today we have Doug Thompson on. We were talking about his uh, Ironmans before here, so we'll hopefully jump into some of those stories. But 20 years with Microsoft, AI ambassador, uh, uh, co-authored a book uh, called Rattled Awake. Awake right. Rattled Awake, about life-changing moments, TEDx speaker. Uh, I saw the video that you did with the story inner bully. We'll talk about that storytelling. Very curious about that because it's mm -hmm. something recently that I've been more uh, uh, aware of. Um, what else can I say? Uh, now you're speaking over 100 plus talks that you've done in your career through mm -hmm. corporate independent and uh, runs two podcasts, uh, Tanium podcast, which is more. Is it more tech based? It, yeah. And it's corporate is for the Tanium fans and stuff that we have. OK. And then the Doug Thompson dot com. The Doug Thompson podcast. Podcast. Very creative. I have no creative genes in my song. Just, I can remember that. <laughs> okay. So, uh, welcome to the show. We're going to dive into a bunch of different topics today. Thank you for being on. Sure. Nice to meet you. Thank you. So, um, for for somebody that's you know watching the show, uh, coming from corporate and saying, "Hey, I spent 20 years at Microsoft. What was that transition point for you from uh, Microsoft to now speaking, writing books, doing your own thing, running podcasts. What was the reason for that? And what's that look like for you? Yeah, it, it was a journey. And, and a lot of times, because I enjoyed what I was doing all along those 20 years. I, I loved going out and, and explaining technology to a finance officer or a marketing or somebody that doesn't necessarily, they don't really care about the technology. They just got problems they need to get solved. And along the way, I discovered that if I could tell stories that related to them, that they could relate to, they were much more likely to understand what I'm trying to do and the value of it. It was, it was stickier. And, and I found this out. We were doing an interview at Microsoft for one a position similar to mine. We'd open it up on the team and we'd gone through seven or eight people, you know, and, and, and they were very technically smart. But my manager point said, look, they can't tell a story like you do. And at that time, because I'm so close to it, I just sort of, develop that over time because I like story. I like to read. I like movies. And I was unconscious that I was able to do something different. You know, we all sort of think that well, everybody can do what I do. There's nothing unique. And I, at that point in time, it dawned on me that it was. And then I sort of started, you know, teasing the idea, well, there's a lot of people coming up behind me because I've watched a lot of been to technical shows, trade in, and you just, you're in the back of the room and you're falling asleep or you know, they, they, they like, they're, they're nerds talking to each other. It's almost like if you watch Big Bang, it's like if you had a bunch of room full of Sheldons talking to each other, you'd be like, wait a minute. You know, I'm the Leonard in the room a little bit, if you will. And I said, there's got to be a better way. Because they're not reaching their full potential because they can't communicate with a broader spectrum of audience. They can talk to people that are like them. Correct. But how do I then broaden my, how do I show my impact to people outside of that? because not everybody's in that room and i said i wanted to go ahead and, and i and i and, and when i was i took on a lot of mentees during that time and that was part of my goal was to hey look you know let, let's talk about this let's do better you can there's better ways to accomplish this and i started teaching them the parts of storytelling the things that work for me and they got better and then i'd watch them go do things that i couldn't it was just amazing to watch the change much like when i was a mentor and team and training watching somebody that couldn't swim a length of the pool to finish in a half Ironman triathlon. You know, it's, it's a journey and you get to watch them grow. So that sparked me. It, it, I was at the point of my time. I'm not 20 years old anymore. Now it's time for me to give back. If you look at the stages of your life, I'm sort of in that part where I want to really give back and help other people. And that's, you know, that, that was sort of the spur that going. And, and it was a journey. I, well, let's open a podcast. That was during the COVID type thing. Let's start talking about that. Let's, let's explore TED. I want to do a TED talk. You know, all good speakers have a TED talk or something in their background. So I said, you know, let's go do that, much like an Iron Man. I want to do, do an Iron Man. And, you know, as I get, get towards the end of the corporate career, you know, I'm not there yet, but when I get there, I want to be able to sort of have this business and be able to go out and do some, you know, some talks on my own because I still have a lot to give. I want to look back and if, if, you, if you're Harry Potter, my, my kids, my daughter, who's 30-something, but they all like Harry Potter. And I got to where I watched Harry Potter. And there was a bad guy in there, Voldemort. Come here. Anyway, he was a bad guy, and, and he created these things called a Horcrux, which was basically he put a little bit of his soul into some object or something so that he could live forever. I sort of take that spin this way of I want to put a little bit of my soul and teach you to put a little bit of your soul into other people. So in effect, you're living 
forever through them. Makes right? sense. You're, you're creating a lasting impact on it because we've all had people in our lives that made an impact on us that that we sort of every day or, or, or you know what, what made you want to go sort of go into the business you're in right there was something along the way that said hey i want to do this and that's what i want to inspire other people because they, they just they don't know what they don't know and they don't know how to ask so i can speak their language so i want to go out and try to help them so got it so I, I think that's powerful because there's times where i've realized that hey i'm good at this but i don't think that's a big deal mm -hmm. Be, you know, because it's you it's do it not, every day. It's not something that you necessarily have to struggle for. Mm -hmm. Not saying that it's not difficult. You didn't do work there, but it's a, a specific skill, and it's easy for other people to see it, but not necessarily you know mm -hmm. yourself. Um, so you interested in movies, interested in learning. You have this personality. You're technical, but you're able also to combine you know stories and. Did did you develop the the ability to tell stories because you f you were stuck when you were having conversations with people or how did you develop that storytelling ability in the beginning phase and then I'll have a second question towards the end. I think some of it was was innate in that I liked stories. Okay. And I was in touch with the ability to tell stories and how it connected with people. But as I got more uh, to your point, you get to a sales price and you go, why did we leave? Said, but they didn't really get the value or they didn't need these other things. And so then as I started trying, I like trying things, try different approaches to go do things. And then I found that, hey, this is working a lot more. Okay. And so I just sort of developed it. Wasn't, it wasn't that quite conscious where a light switch flipped, but we all sort of go, hey, this worked this last time. Let me try it this time and sort of develop it. And then I watched some other people that were very gifted at telling stories and said, hey, look, I want to incorporate some of this, some of that. You know, it just one of those things you, you, you get a passion for, you get you get connected to it, and you build upon it. Got it. So now you got people that are coming up behind you. They're able to talk the technical part because there are some people that sell, this is what the product is, this is what the product does, you know, and it's technical. It's all logical. There's no emotion involved. So you're now mentoring other people at this company saying, hey, I need to help these guys be able to speak through stories, understand the emotional part of it. Did you have some kind of structure on how you taught them to use stories? Was it more of you sharing, hey, here's the story I use, here's when I use it? Is it, hey, here's the psychology of storytelling? Mm -hmm. How did you transfer that skill set to them? That's something I'm like formalizing what that is, is something I'm working on right now. Okay, so, got so I'm it. Working on a, I'm working on a book here, and it's called, and it's, I'm working on formalizing that so I have a structure with it. Okay. Uh, but I, I knew there were certain pillars of which I could tell you which worked. Okay. Right. But it's also somewhat individual because the worst experience I ever had I, when, before I went to Microsoft, um, this was around the Windows Me, Windows 2000 time frame. And, and I was a contract trainer. I'd, I'd been doing training on like some of the Microsoft products for a vendor. And they said, hey, look, Microsoft's looking for trainers to go do this roadshow. And what a roadshow is basically, think about it, is, is at that time, the System Builder channel, which was every mom and pop shop where, hey, there's a computer store in every corner. They built things together. It was well before the world of only Day Dell, HP, you know, these, these others that exist today. But they were fanatic. And all they really wanted was somebody from Microsoft to come out and show like they cared for them. So, so the guy that was running this workshop, he was a Broadway actor. Now, the, to me, this was just totally blew my mind because usually if you have the artistic mindset, they don't usually understand the technical mindset of what goes on. It's, it's very you know, Correct. It's I've sort seen of that. binary. Yeah. And he got both. And he was able to go back and, and connect with those audiences at a level. That, I mean, they were just fans. They wanted his autograph. They wanted to do these other things. And, and it was because he represented Microsoft at the time. It was a touch from a corporate side who they have been doing business with. Mm. So, so it's that connection. And, and we went in and I'm why there's 10 other people in there like me sort of learning It's a week long workshop and they're going to pick the trainers for the events that are coming up afterwards. And in here had this guy, I'll call him the professor. He had the, the tweed jacket and the elbow patches, you know, very, very dignified when he was, and I really liked that style. And I tried to emulate that style all week, and I was failing miserably. You might be able to tell the way I'm hitting microphones and stuff around here. That just didn't work for me. But I was trying, and I, and I get to the and I get to the last night before we're supposed to have our big um, performance to um, audition, if you will. And I've talked to my wife. So I don't be I don't belong here. So here's two things working. One, the inner mind says you don't belong here. You stink because I've been failing all week. So my my inner bully had been telling me stories. 
And my wife said, well, what's been going on? You, you, you're naturally good at this. And I said, well, I've been doing it. She said, that's not you. Mm. You can't become somebody in four days, even if you could. That's not you. You've got to go back and be the best you that you can be. Yeah. So I went back out the next day. There's, you know, it's just energy's flying everywhere. I, I was in my natural spa- uh, space, knocked the computer off the desk. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was chaos going on. And at the end of it, you know, I thought I did well. I got a call back from the guy. Lay says, I've waited for that guy to show up all week. Because just from the introduction and stuff, he, he sort of was good at picking out people. And he says, you were the best one there. That last day, you were the best one there. So I ended up doing half of the road shows that went on, and I got sort of a feel for how you go tell a story, relate to the audience, do some things like that. And I've sort of built upon that my whole career. Okay. So, but that, again, I could not be the professor. I can appreciate the style of it, but that's yeah. not me. You have to be a, your authentic and, self. And that's why when I'm mentoring somebody, I'm, I've got a different skill set that I'm working with. And some of them have been more reserved and more professional, more like that. And I try to coach them in that method. So yeah. there, there are some structure in, in, and I break it down to eight steps. I sort of call it to create a story. One of it is you, you got to meet the hero. So in the, in the stories we tell from a technology perspective, the customer is the hero. You got to make them the heroes, not the product. That's wrong. If you're making the product the hero, it's that's like, powerful. I guess when, when, when too yeah. many, that's where too many people that really love what they do, telling a story, they start wrong. They start with our products, the best to go do. I that's don't care. really powerful. Right, so so, they come to you with problems and pain and these other things, and I'm, that's my job is synthesize that. Okay, knowing what our product can do, how can I tell a story that relates to solving that? And do we have a use case that somebody else done the same thing? Stay on that part in terms of mm-hmm. if you can, please making yeah. the customer the hero. Mm-hmm. Ex- can you expand on that? What that means? Yeah, maybe you were. Well, one, it does the emotional connection. So so you know the we 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 make we we evaluate things on logic. But the buying decision is almost always done emotionally. Correct. Yeah. Right. So how do you attach that emotion? People can't be emotionally attached to numbers unless you're an accountant. Right. (laughs) Um, So how do you get them where the numbers don't necessarily matter? Right. It's the what the product can do to solve your pain, your problem, whatever you have. Okay. And it's understanding. So so part you know, I've had to study, okay, finance people care about these things. Right. Uh, marketing managers care about these things. And so I have sort of this persona in my mind of sort of the general area of what the product can do for those things. Then I add, and I call this part of special sauces, I'll do LinkedIn stalking or I'll do some other stuff to find out what do they like, what do they know about, or maybe it's something about the company. So you're taking the extra time to go look at who they are, their right. interests. Okay. Again, trying to personalize, because because the if, if and this is a second step, is I start the story where the customer is. So that's where I begin the story. It's not once upon a time somewhere. It's hey, you know, you, you're you're sitting at this desk and you got this problem today. So they they're more willing to come along for the storytelling ride if you meet them where they are rather do than asking re- them to come where I'm at. Do you already know their problem, or you're asking questions to identify their problem? Yeah, sometimes I, I have a general idea. You know, each end of I mean, it's, it's been in technology long enough to sort of get a general idea of what this is, but. There are other questions, and you know that's part of the things that you're having to build the story on the fly to either confirm or make tweaks to what the story you want to tell them is. But yeah, it's all about again asking those questions, okay? Because that helps you build a better story, and also helps me uncover additional pain that they hadn't initially man, you know, uh, mentioned. Okay, so the customer is the hero. Mm-hmm. Uh, meet them where their story is. Mm-hmm. Okay, what else? You said there was eight different steps. So, so then then you've got the the typical story arc, right? You got to go through. <clears throat> hey, here's what they had. You know, things change. What's what's the change moment that changed every day? And what you know, then so they here's the struggle I've got to go through, right? And then, depending on how long the meeting is, you know, you can't do a whole lot in a half hour. But you know, you want to sort of take them on this journey of where you, here's the tension, and then you got to relieve the tension, and that gives them chance to sort of absorb what's going. Because if you watch a movie unless it's a Michael Bay movie, it's not, you know, it's not a hundred, it's not put to the floor the whole time. Right. <laughs> okay. Cause you need to have these ebbs and flows that, that go on. That's where white reading, mo- reading books and watching movies help me sort of understand a flow of a story. So you're taking them through their day. They, they've explained what their day is. And in the story using, well, you mentioned have all these other things and this probably caused 
you to work late nights or do these other things you know that, that you didn't really yeah i really didn't like that okay but then you know so as you come on you build this and you you were able to accomplish it eventually or not and you you go on what's the next one so you're taking on this journey two or three is usually enough to do that and there's no hard and fast rule again it depends on how time it is and then you you show them at the end of the day it's like well, i had a customer just like you and, and a lot of the times i'm making a uh, 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 the, 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 it's a composite of a customer because we have customers at various different phases of their life cycle and maturity. And, you know, there may not be one I've been the whole lifetime with to been on this time struggle, but I've been seen enough that I can put this composite character together to sort of say, hey, here's what happened. I got a customer that did this, blah, blah, blah. And you know, hopefully you've got something that you can prove to a case study. But if not, there's been enough anecdotal evidence and you've seen enough evidence to say this is true. This path is true. You could accomplish this. And you're telling the story about this other company that did this to, to them. They can picture themselves being that other person, right? Uh, and I mentioned when I talk about triathlons early on, I'm, you know, Julie Moss crawling across the finish line. I can see myself, if I had to do that, I could do that. And this is just simply brain science. So I did some brain science thing before I did my TED Talk. <clears throat> on how the brain works and tells stories and the other things. And, and the more interesting the story, the more the struggle you have, the more we remember it. Because the more struggle you have, the more you remember it. Be because you're pulling in more pieces of the brain, right? And the more latches you have in the brain, the more emotional context you have in the, the other thing. It's more memorable than, yeah, this, this thing was 100 bucks more than the other. Correct. Right? So you have that connection. So going out, you do the struggle. They're the hero. And then you have, okay, here's what's next. Okay, this is sort of okay, the end of chapter one. Here's chapter two. Let's do a POC. Let's go prove this. Let's go show these other things. Now, along those lines, there's the number eight thing, which is the special sauce. And again, this is where it's very individual. Again, in mine, my stories are going to have humor. They're going to have, they're typically going to be about sports or something like that, or kids or grandkids. But it's my flavor. It's my unique touch that helps make the story mine one it makes it easier for me to tell again i don't have to try to be the professor and two it is uniquely you they under and it has to sort of match what your vibe is for them to believe it because it, they can see as you're as a good a good speaker <clears throat> you can tell when somebody's not really sure and somebody's being genuine All right you go look at tony robbins i mean <clears throat> he's very passionate about that thing Correct. And it comes across, you can't help but know, I mean, his voice gives me, and, and so that's the special sauce, and there's a few things that you could carve out to do that, but the, the, the same model sort of works regardless of how long you're in there. You just have sort of a dust and maybe skip a step, and, you know, maybe it's one struggle today, and we'll talk about these other things tomorrow. But you're trying to make that connection that you understand what their pain is, their problem, and you've got a way that can help them. Right? Got but, it. but they're going to do the work to go do this. I'm not going to magically fix it. Correct. I'm going to give you the tools that you can then go magic and fix it. Then how's that make you look upstream? A lot of times I'm, I'm helping them manage up as well. Cause yeah, I've got to give them the story that they go to go tell the CFO or whoever. Got right? it. Right. You know, so at the end of the day, when you go talk to CFO, we're at the end of the day, you're saving money because you've got more manpower to go direct it at what you need. You don't have to hire extra headcount to go do something. Got it. I think that, I think that there's some, I'm a very logical, like structured person. So as I'm learning in terms of understanding what are the steps, you know, so I think there's mm -hmm. some people that they're more charismatic, right? Depending on that profile, this profile, or whatever assessment it is and having this, the steps of how to tell a good story mm -hmm. or, uh, the breakdown as well as for different personalities. So I don't know what the book that, you know, when that book comes out, would love to read it. Um, but the different personality types and how storytelling for them will be different based on their personality. That's good input. I like yeah. to, so, so I'll dedicate that chapter to you. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually thought about that, but that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I, I think different different personality types tell stories mm -hmm. different. It's kind of what yeah, you just yeah. said. Um, we have one of our guys, Fred Terrace, who comes from Broadway as well. Now he does insurance and investments. Yeah. But his people skills and his oh, ability yeah. to connect and the way he speaks from stage, mm -hmm. those two bringing that technical and that, you know, uh, personal yeah. uh, touch is unique. So so you get on a TEDx. How did you get to TEDx, first of all, and why? Mm -hmm. Did you want to be on it? Were you seeking it out? Yeah, again, wanting to be a speaker, having a TEDx that you could point to sort of shows, well, okay, well, at least I can get on stage and not fall off, right? So at <laughs> least I've, I've met the, the bare minimum. 
<clears throat> so I put it as something I wanted to do. <clears throat> and and I, I put my sales mindset onto it. Okay, so I said, look, okay, I can apply to these big ones. And I applied to some big ones and got turned down, and I don't like rejection. So um, I, I got to the point where, let me get a smaller one. Let me get some, and, and local, so I don't have to fly. And, you know, there's like, so, so Blinn, Blinn um, College, I mean, College Station was holding their first, it was a first TEDx thing. And I was too late to get the speakers for this one. But I said, look, I'm going to go to this. I'm going to go check it out. You know, first time you look at them, yeah, I could be, I could, you're, sort of, you're sort of gauging yourself against the other speakers. Could I do this? But the other ones, I got to meet the people that were organizing it. Again, sort of, hey, great thing. I really, I want to be, you know, included in the next one. Can you keep me posted? And I stayed in touch with, again, this is the sales 101. I stayed in touch with them over time. Hey, what are you thinking? You know, I saw this other thing here to go do this, trying to add value to them. And then lo and behold, when it came time, they sort of, hey, look, we're going to open up the call for speakers next week. You know, they sent me, here's what it's going to look like. And I said, okay, here's a typo on this page. So I sent that back to them before they published it. Just luckily I caught it um because i'd have normally blown over it but they said okay kind of fine here you got to do this demo video and stuff and okay i now i've got a chance to go accomplish this ted talk this tedx and i'm like okay great how do i stand out with all these auditions and stuff but picking a smaller audience i knew that my chances were probably better to get in this because it was sort of going to the radar of the, the of some of the top people and i'd met the people again they're going to be sort of looking i i Again, I was meeting them where they were and telling a story. I've been working with them. I was a known comp commodity. You're more likely to talk to somebody that you know or seen than, than you are. And so then I had to go do this. And I actually did it from a, a technical conference. I did it from a hotel room. I had to do my, here's, you know, here, you got to do your speech. You got to do your talk. <clears throat> it doesn't have to be all in one flow. We know you're going to polish it and do some other things because it's like three or four months out. But that's how they're going to make their decision. And so I do it and I film it and it, it needs to be about 12 minutes. My original script was 30 minutes. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. We're going to have to trim this down a little bit. Because I like to add color and, you know, backstory. And uh, Ted, you got 12 minutes to get your point across. So, so the, the experience did teach me some brevity is sometimes very good in telling a story. So I'd go and, you know, it's like you're cutting out part of your children. You're throwing, <laughs> I really like this part, right? And, and, yeah. So I got that down. I got it down to like 12 minutes <clears throat> and they chose me. And so now it's the week, like they didn't have the exact date when they were going to have it. So my wife, my family and I scheduled a week long trip down in Grand Cayman. Well, that <clears throat> the TEDx was the day after we got back. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, well, I, can't, I can't cancel on this. So I'm out on the beach in the morning, practicing my talk, doing these other <laughs> things because we had to do it. So if we had the dress rehearsal, then you had the, the performance so the dress rehearsal we're on there they're going to film both and they're going to do some magic of slicing the best of both of them together and they did that in mine i'll be perfectly honest they, there was a couple slices in there that but i've never done the same thing twice in my entire life especially t now the theme of it may be the same but the delivery is never the same because a lot of it depends on the audience i'm talking sure. to. As i said where's my audience what's the topic of the day you, again you got to sort of make that connection with your audience to, so that they'll buy in and listen because there's too many other distractions they can have be it phone be it something else that goes on <clears throat> and so but i got through it i had to stand in a six foot circle the red circle i am a i'm a prowler i have to prowl the stage to get out and i've, I've been known to be in the back of the audience at some times because <clears throat> i like to do that connection and so that made me sort of feel unnatural and a little pent up you know i was like okay there's there's energy here i can't get out and <clears throat> excuse me as i'm going through it i'm not having fun and, and the, the the playback the story that i'm telling is not the way i've played it back in my head ten thousand times so when i finished it <clears throat> i got off stage i wasn't happy with what the performance was i said i did not meet what i what i envisioned in my head and so I was a bit down on myself, go see my wife and daughter who were in there. And it says, you know, like, you know they, and they say, look, you've done better, but you've done, you know, you did a really good job. And that's not what you want to hear. That's not what I want to hear. <laughs> but a young man came up to me afterwards and he had his notebook and he had driven, he, he only had three slides and he had sort of drawn some <clears throat> things on the slide and he'd written some notes. He said, I got a couple questions to follow up with you. 
and I spent a good five minutes with him and stuff on that. We answered a question. She said, thank you. That was, they're very impactful. And then it, it sort of changed my perspective on it in that that's my goal is if I can impact one person's life to think and do something differently than I've accomplished something. Cause that's one person that may have never heard that story that impacted with him. And that's why when I talk to people that say, well, you know, I've got nothing to share. It's nothing unique. You got these other things that, yeah, you do, because there's somebody out there in the vast world of people that you've told, and, and I had somebody on LinkedIn reach out to me and say, look, I've seen these, I've seen things like this, Hunter, but for some reason I had your video in my feed today, and it changed. now she's, she's doing dog rescues and these other things, and she's blown up. She's done some other things, because she saw my video that I posted that day that I didn't think was that remarkable. So again, getting out and telling your story um, and doing that, but that's the, that was a TED, that was a TED, I was miserable. I, I didn't like it. I may go do another one. <laughs> I'd do it differently, but I was like, this is unnatural. This was, this was one thing. Be careful what you ask for. You may get it. <laughs> yeah. But that's, but that's great though, because it, it is uh, a lot of times when you're doing things the first time it's unnatural, mm -hmm. right? We talk about the, everything in our business is awkward, then mechanical, then natural. Right. You know? Um, so did you have the topic already on what you wanted to cover on TEDx? Or was like, Hey, I want to tell the power of stories or <laughs> Did you just want to get out there and you figured it out well, along the way? I had a story I wanted to tell, but it was different than the story I told. Okay, got it. I, I, I liked Paul Harvey back in the day did a, told this thing every day was during the week. It was like the rest of the story. And it was basically a story told in reverse. Now, Mike Rowe sort of revived that with the way I heard it and doing that. Mike Rowe's a fantastic storyteller. But what you do is you learn a little bit of background about the person. At the end of it, you find out who that person is. So the whole thing is you're trying to listen to the story and got it gather and so i like that yeah. story i like that i said you know and i said let me work on storytelling because it is very impactful and i did the brain science and i did these other things but when i really spun it around and you can sort of see this in if you watch the tedx you can sort of see when the transition takes place where i'm much more comfortable in what's going on after i get through the science and stuff and I was, it is the actual personal type thing of where the inner bully is talking to me yeah i saw that because the whole time that i'm now you've got this you stink. You should not be on stage to be able to get <laughs> this guy. This starts working against me. And I'm like, just, just be quiet. You know, and, and, I, and I'm like, you start believing it. And I'm like, I, I don't, you get this imposter syndrome, this doubt that's going on in your head. And, and, and it, it, it you know, I was like, that guy, no, I got it. I'm going to write this story. I'm going to change it to write about this, to write about this inner story. Because no matter how well I tell an outer story, if that inner story is out of whack, it's powerful. It's not going to work. So, so yeah. as I start saying, how do I fight this inner bully? How do I fight this subconscious thing that is working? It's doing this job. It's trying to protect me from, you know, it, it developed early on when we we're running from dinosaurs. There's a lack of dinosaurs out. I don't know if you noticed that lately. Yeah. But, but so now we invent things to be, you know, to, to cause us, well, we can't do that. You can't do an Iron Man because you're old and fat. Well, okay, well, I'll, I'll go ahead and do that. Um, so I wrote it about that because that was my struggle during the time. I sort of pivoted to go do that during that. But I did weave into storytelling because it is all, yeah. it's all storytelling. We're all we're naturally wired to learn from stories and to tell stories. But we, the phone with the texting and, and school. When I went to school, we had to talk to people. You know, you had one phone in the house, you had to pick it up, and hopefully you had a long cord where you can go around the corner and nobody heard you. Yeah. But now phones are mainly text or instant messaging or something, or you may do a Snapchat or do something like that, but it's very short form that you don't develop, kids don't develop that, that skill of being able to work and tell stories. Cause that's the way you connected with people. That's powerful. And you know, one thing I want, I, I want to go back to schools. I think schools kids should teach this. And I, I've talked at colleges and stuff before about sort of your career doesn't have a syllabus. That's one of my favorite talks because they've been in this structured environment all their life where they knew how to succeed, right? If I do A, B, and C, I'm getting an A. Yeah. All right? But corporate world's not like that. <laughs> Just, you know, there's, no, there's no cutting fast drive. So how do I then learn to tell my story? Here's the work that, without sounding like you're bragging, right? Yeah. So there's sort of, you know, you have to sort of say, well, what did you do to do this? Well, well, when I helped again, and again, when you're telling it to that, I made the customer the hero to go do that. I, you know, I, you sort of fade a little bit into the, to the fabric of the story and you're not the star of the story. Well, do that. What are some of the mistakes that you see when people tell stories? <clears throat> that they rely too much. They don't do the emotional attachment. It's very scripted. There's no, you know, they don't put them in it. 
Okay. Anybody could go read a line when you're, when you're acting and stuff, you go on, you try to find the best person that's a fit for that role in the way that they portray it. You know, we all play, portray something in mind, but, but in the stories that they tell is one, they rely too much on facts and figures in my, my space. Right. So, so in the, these other things, but, but even the kids, when they're getting out of school, they read me their resume. That's their story. I said, no, 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 no. You know, I could hire anybody from here and not get fired. Why are you the best person to do that? What did you, well, I was part of this team. What did you do in the team? Well, I helped organize things. What did, what the impact? So you have to sort of lead them along to sort of learn that you can tell what you did here without sounding braggadocious about it. But you do you, at the end of the day, you can share what that impact was. And, and to them say, okay, yeah, I see why you, you, you're a big team player with that. Or, um, but don't rely on the facts and figures and, and for God's sake, make it your own. Don't, copy somebody else what 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 is it that drives you to want to be a speaker <clears throat> there's an energy you get back from being on stage it's, it's, it's that's my drug okay <laughs> I mean, well, there's an energy you get back when you're on stage but also that part i've impacted that one person and if i keep Makes impacting sense. that one person you know i want to I, that one that i want that to be my legacy that hey look you know i learned this from this old you know bald fat guy that used to do triathlons he taught me this, and you know it sort of goes down like that. So that's that's really the reason I do it. And your your talk on stage, you you talked about having an inner bully, mm -hmm. All right? Ex can you expand on that? And then when did you become aware of your inner bully? I know he's seven feet tall, and <laughs> I forgot his name, but uh, Simon. Simon. And he has an English accent, so yes. you may picture who I picture that character <laughs> yeah. after. But it dawned on me during that. The, the TED talk as I'm preparing for it. That's when I could really articulate what it was. I knew I had it, like when we talked about the triathlons earlier, the voice saying, hey, look, you're old and fat. You did a pretty good job getting this far. You should quit, right? So, I, so I, I'd, I'd experienced it before, but I couldn't put my finger on it. We've all had these things where it's like deja vu. I, I know this sound looks familiar, but I can't tell you exactly what it is. And that's what that was. And, and I'm listening to that and, and I'm like, wait, this is my subconscious. This is this bully here working doing what it's supposed to do help us from, save us from dinosaurs but is it serving it and, and now i have gotten to where i it, they don't go away i've never met anybody that's totally 100 percent said you know i don't have that anymore but you learn how to manage it you learn when it comes on my favorite thing to do is is ask for receipts expand Pro on prove to that me where yeah. i can't do that yeah right where in the past have i not been able to do this and after a few, it, it usually, again, I'm actually, you think you're talking to a dialogue. It's like I was talking to my dogs. I'm having a conversation with my dogs the other day. But I'm negotiating with the subconscious to get around where it's comfortable with what I'm doing then. And it goes, sort of calms down and goes back into his room. Okay. It, it's that, it's that self-talk, but I turn it into positive because that's, that's the biggest thing is that is the humans are wired to be negative. To have this negative mindset. That's Why are they wired that way? I I, 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 I feel like I'm wired that way more than anything else because if we're worried about negative, then we're going to protect ourselves, mm. right? There's a there's a bully. There's there's a dinosaur around the corner. There's something else. So there's danger everywhere. So I think you don't come to that from a positive mindset. <laughs> there's Correct. danger yeah, everywhere, yeah. right? You have to I be able you. to react. Yeah. And I think that's where that stems from, and the things I've read to sort of confirm that. But the the part of you have a choice in the morning, and, and Tara LaFont Gooch, who's a friend of mine, and I'm working with her, she wrote a book about gratitude. She, grant, she has a great thing. I am grateful for the opportunities that I've been given. And when I, when I have that gratitude, I start off every day with a little meditation, gratitude type thing, saying, here's what I'm thankful for today. And I'll use an example the other day. The days that I don't do it are, are worse days for me. I, I woke up the other morning going to the gym to work out. I just started to go back to lifting weights and I had a bad dream that sort of put me off on this bad path somewhere. And I said, look, you know, usually I listen to podcasts and stuff during the day. So look, I just need to listen to some music that's going to put me in a better frame of mind. And it totally changed my outlook on the day. So, so the gratitude starting with that, that I'm lucky to be, I'm lucky to be here a guest with you to have that. And I want to get my message out. And I want to do that. So coming from that place of gratitude, helps keep the inner bully at bay if you will so so it's the 
yeah, I, I can go do this. I'm grateful to have the opportunity to go do this. Let me see. Because then when you open that up, then you find out I'm going to find ways to go do it. Right? So in, in, the, in the triathlon thing, I found out ways, look, if I, I can't miss this day of training, I've got to go out and go do this or I'm not going to be able to make the starting line. Yeah. And, and so it's, it is a mindset thing that you're constantly sort of battling with. I think that's powerful what you said, though, in terms of looking for receipts. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was getting started in the business, I would and I would struggle and I would ask myself questions like, where is it written in the world that I can't be that? Where is it? You know, where where is there proof that I can't do that? Mm -hmm. Because we get stuck in the the doubting and we don't go. We don't we don't do the other side of that. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. It's easy to do when you see all the stuff coming in or you're it's been a bad month. You haven't done that. So, I mean, it's easy to sort of fall back into that. But realize we all go through these tough times. And at the end of the day, if we hadn't gone through that struggle, we would not put in the work and stuff to be able to get to that next plateau to go do things. Because mm-hmm. I find in, in, in the Ironman, I said, I about quit. But I kept going. I got the second wind after I said I got back on and I did that. So that's you know very much the same thing. And, and how do you what advice do you give to people to counteract that that inner bully? So one is receipts. Mm-hmm. Any other advice there? Um, so again, Start with a, as positive of attitudes you can be. You're not happy all the time, but say something bad happens. You know, and say, okay, ask for receipts. Was it just my fault? Sometimes things happen just to happen because, you know, we, we have no control over that. The only way we have control over things is how we respond to a stimulus on the outside. Correct. I just say encourage yourself to, before you act, think about what, it's the best thing that could come out of this because okay. this happened. Not the worst case. Okay. What's the best case that could happen? I, in, a, in the book I wrote about my sort of last year uh, you know, uh, challenge I had at work. And I had that. It was either like, okay, I can. It awoke in, it, I'm not going to steal it so you, so you get the book. But it made me aware that if you call it God or call it whatever you want, higher being, they're talking to us and they present us with opportunities, but because of our mindset and inner bully, sometimes we don't see them. We don't see them for what they are. Um, if we're looking, I'll use the car example, right? So, so you go out and I'm going to go buy this red Tesla. All of a sudden, everybody's driving red Tesla. I realize Austin's a bad example for that because everybody's got a Tesla on that. But you start seeing those things that come up. It's, it's not a manifestation as much as it is an awareness of opportunities that are out there. And so when things happen, do a bigger, broader search of it before you react to it. To pause. Don't do that initial thing where I got to panic and go crawl up in a ball and go to bed. I do know that when I do get in that, because I've fallen back in that, when I do get in that pity pool mindset of this happen, starting to think negatively, it's going to take me about two weeks to get out of it. But I actually use that as hope. And then I have to process what happened. I have to work through these stages. You know, they have the seven stages of grief or yeah. whatever. I've got to work through those to get to the point where then I can go take an opportunity of that. But I, I don't lose hope. There's always that, like, there's the finish line is just over there. I just know I have to work a little bit harder to get to it. Yeah, that, that internal work takes a little bit of time. Mm-hmm. You know, I get that, I get that part. Um, we talk about in our business mm-hmm. condensing how long you're down. You know, mm-hmm. before something go wrong and you're like, you're down for a, m- a month. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now yeah. you have a bad month, you have a whole bad six months, yeah. you know, and then yeah. you mature to, to shorten that time frame, right? Where, it's, okay, it's a week, man, I lost a day. Mm-hmm. Now it's like, I lost an hour. Now it's like, okay, man, you know, take your five minutes, 10 minutes. How fast can you get, right. can it's, you get back to the right state of mind? Yeah, exactly. You know? it's, it's, it's that resilience. Yeah. Again, which we're not serving our, kids well enough anymore because they you know, some parents are the helicopter parents they don't let them fail yeah you know and, and schools now are sort of geared where they don't necessarily let them fail all the time when everybody has to get to get up and but i learned more from failure i've learned more from a skint knee or these other things and the biggest skill was how to get back up yeah the resilience that you talk about how do i because if you shorten that time as you said then it has less impact overall and i think it's i think it's creating systems for you yeah because success leaves clues right. so that then you could say, okay, here's my sequence of here's mm-hmm. what, you know, how I process this failure. Here's the questions I ask here, You know, mm-hmm. I don't think, I think that that's, that, that would be an interesting topic of what is the system for how I process failure. Mm-hmm. We may want to do a video on that. Um, because I think, I think having a system for that 
can yeah. create more consistent routines. Yeah, no, I think um, you're right. Because if you see, again, it gets back to telling the customer story. They're the hero. You're telling your side of that story. I can see that somebody else has done it. I can picture myself in that mind. Can Would this work for me? Yeah. Right. And, and I think the other part, too, is also training your mind to – uh, what is the best case scenario? Mm-hmm. I think I think I think we don't do that. I was watching this show one time, and this young lady kept you know rejecting people, and so the therapist ends up saying, you know, the reason that you do that is because if you reject them first, they can't reject you. That's you, a, yeah. you know, and um, and it goes back to why do we prepare for all the worst things, mm-hmm. right? Uh, in terms of prepared for fear, dinosaur around the corner, you know, because if we could prepare for all the bad things that can happen then we won't be as hurt when they happen. Yeah. But then all of a sudden our brain doesn't look for all the great things that happen or the abundance that can happen. And, mm-hmm. you know, uh, uh, again, it's that being more aware of, of um, opportunities that when you're looking for them, mm-hmm. you know, and that's where the gratitude and that stuff comes in as I try yeah. to sort of s- slow down or negate the n- negative tendencies that we as humans have, again, looking at all these other things and sort of like, then that opens up that, Hey, I can see this and again. Thinking about what's the best that can happen. Would you say that, you know, because how old are you now, Doug? What, do we have to tell you? Oh, okay. So, so. <laughs> Just say I'm in my mid-60s. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, from, from, I'm 38, uh, father, two kids, mm-hmm. third on the way, running a business. Um, You're busy. Yes, we're, we're busy. <laughs> Everybody's busy. Uh, what, what would you say as you've gone from, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60, that's really shifted in you? I, um, inner awareness of what's inside. All right. So, so I, I have two kids now and I have seven grandkids. Oh, nice. That. Um, being a grandparent's a great role, right? As you probably aware, <laughs> like here, it's broken. <laughs> you take, take it back. <laughs> um, but more aware of the value that I bring to the table. Um, you know, what, what are my skills? What, getting more sure of that again, because I've looked at, I've been through a lot of these, a lot of these trials and tribulations. I've been through, like I was at Microsoft, we went through, we we're making gazillion dollars. We're making no money. Apple's killing us to now, you know, they started to come back where they're one of the big companies again. So how do you get through these evolutions? We all have to change. Um, and it's, how do you adapt to that change? I've changed it enough to know that nothing is permanent, which gives me confidence to know that, okay, it may be bad now. It will get better. That's there great. I've changed enough to know nothing. It's changed. I've seen change yeah. enough to know nothing is permanent. <clears throat> and it's like I've done enough triathlons to sort of know that, okay, here's the cycle of stuff that goes on. So it's repetition, I guess, more than anything else. And then not being afraid to not being the smartest person in the room. Mm. Some of us will get that fear where they know more than I do. Rarely, if I'm the smartest person in the room, I'm in the wrong room or I'm alone. So I'm giving you guys a lot of credit. I got you. <laughs> for that. Yeah. And it's simply being comfortable with that, but also bringing them value. Because there's things I know that I can bring them that they don't know, that they haven't seen before. And not being intimidated by, you know, occasionally you'll get the heckler or somebody that wants to, you know, and then how do you handle that graciously, right? How do you accept that and work through that? You know, comedians are really good about, because they get that a lot. How do you sort of... you you got the you got the inner bully somebody's inner bully on the outside. <laughs> now, how do you how do you adapt and, and handle that? So just being know that knowing yourself enough that you can yeah I can pivot over here I can do these other things and not getting into this confrontation. There, there's ways around that. I mean there's sometimes you have to go through things, um, but I've again been through enough to, to to sort of recognize the signs which are okay. Here's where I'm at today. What can I see? The best time I, you know, the best performances I had as an engineer back at, at Microsoft were when the house was on fire. So we were going after a customer, do something, deployment. All of a sudden, they can't get email, they can't get calendar, they can't get these other things. So it's really, you know, their their, their house is on fire, and we sold them the product that yeah. is doing that to them. And okay, we're going to work through this. We will fix the problem. How do you do that? So, you know, getting everybody on the same page, <clears throat> finding out what each group needed, you know, what was going on, what happened. But being that visionary, we can say, look, there's, and I'll use sailing as an example. I don't know if you've ever been sailing. No. <clears throat> it's not a straight line. So if I want to get across the lake and the wind is in my face, I'm not going to take a straight line to get there. I have to do what they call tacking. So I'm doing this. 
but I'm always got that on the horizon or when I'm on an open water swim, I don't, there's no lane lines on the bottom of lake or something. How do I know where the turn is? And the buoy they have is only like about six foot tall, but if you got people thrashing you and stuff, you really can't see it. So I'm looking off in the distance at a tree or something else. So it's again, keeping my perspective, I know where I'm going. We may tack to get there. And that's the best leaders I've had were, were those people that could sort of articulate that. Hey, we're going through this little struggle here. But we're keeping our eye on where we're going. We'll get through this rough patch and there's smoother waters up ahead. So learning to sort of look further ahead than today. As you, as you look further ahead with AI, with what you're doing since you were an AI ambassador, what are like the top three shifts that you see coming down the road? Well, there's fear. We're smack dab in the middle of that. AI is going to take my job. And, I, uh, fear. And in, any, in any transition, yes, there's, a, there's nobody making ice boxes anymore when the refrigerator came along. Right? There's certain things that, 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 that will go away. But there's also you know, kids in school today, they're training for jobs that don't exist yet. And that, that's a daunting task when you think about it. How are you going to train me to do something? You teach them to think. You teach them to be resourceful. Now, AI is a great tool, and I'll use it as an example. <clears throat> Yesterday, we were in a training, and the opening was, you, know, you have an icebreaker, you know, we're filling out these quizzes and stuff on that. So they asked something about when did we get our 350th customer, and I'm doing a little search here. I'm using, I'm using AI to search, and I'm searching internally, and I find... Oh, here's the document in the syllabus. Of which <laughs> so, so our team scored 100% because we, they didn't say we couldn't. That's funny. It's, it's good. Yeah. But again, it's I, because I know how to use those things. I embrace AI for what it is. I don't trust it 100%, but it can, do, it can make you much more powerful, right, to go do it. So I think not doing it's not an option. Right, saying we're never going to do AI, we're not going to. That's not an option because you'll go out of business pretty soon. Being afraid that it's going to take your job, you need to learn how to use it to do your job better. Makes sense. And you can, right? It can be your best. Like when I'm writing something, I'll say, okay, here's my idea. Give me a first draft, and then usually a few hours later or an hour or so later, I've crafted it. Okay, I like this because it's. It's done a lot of the research and some of the business. And now I go back and check facts and figures and stuff on all that, which you should do. Never Again, don't trust it. Trust but verify. But how do you use it to take that stuff that sucks, that's important, but sucks a lot of your time away so that you can spend more time on the things you bring unique value to? Makes sense. Okay. And so giving everybody access in, a, in an organization to AI so that they can do that. Not, not just a few, because if you give the... If you give it to a few, they're going to be the star performers, and that's not fair. And, and what you're doing is you're actually probably not getting the most out of it because there's some people out there that, if they had exposure to it, would do wonderful things. And, and I, I use my example when I was on the board of the Boys and Girls Club up in Georgetown. You would have kids that were from, from underprivileged backgrounds that didn't have a computer at home or something, but they got on that computer, and they were doing some mad stuff. You know, you gave them access to things that then they could go do. So you think about that. That's sort of lay, equals a playing field. and gives everybody a chance to be creative with what it does. You can't put it back in the bottle. It's not going to go away. So banning it is not going to help. But being aware of what it is and trying to keep an eye on the nefarious things that can happen. Do you see, like, three potential for younger people that are maybe watching this? You said we're training younger people to do a job that doesn't exist yet. Mm -hmm. Are there future, you know, I have, I have younger kids right yeah. now. Mm -hmm. So they're too small, two and six months. Yeah. But here in the near future, what do you see are opportunities outside of just, it's not learning how to, I don't know if it's learning how to code anymore, but now no, it's. No, because actually AI can write code better than a lot of people. Yeah. Right? So, so what are like potential industries, careers, opportunities that you see in that for children? So learning again, older, because it may change a little bit as it gets better and more intelligent. But right now, you call it prompt engineering or prompt crafting. The value you get out of AI, right, and say chat GPT. When I talk about AI, I'm talking about chat GPT at this point in time. Um, the value you get out of it is on how well you ask it questions, the prompting that you give it. Yeah, I've seen that. And you get more effective at it. You get more out of it a lot sooner. 
So that is a skill because that will actually help you learn. Always be learning. You don't, you know, just never always be curious about something. But being able to use the technology at your hands to do things, to find out information about it, hey, could I automate this? Has anybody done it? You know, so, so, again, speed up. The, learning how to interact with that is great. Um, th again, there's, there is some coding and stuff that can be involved when you think about, think about autonomous vehicles and all. How do you do that safely? How do you make that where you know, we really need people that can make that more reliable and more timely? And that can simply be we need better networks to get data to it. You know, we don't end up with that problem in Austin where they're all in the park carbon, they're all on the same street stopped because they can't get it. So how do you do that, right? So think about jobs in that field. And think about jobs in like, like what I'm doing in technical sales or something where you're sort of the Pied Piper. You can sort of help create, learn the storytelling, and you can fit anywhere in that. Understand how technology works. But there's still going to be some things in there that are crafty and stuff that that technology can't necessarily replace. Do you see a future where technology does replace jobs and people get like, you know, a, a basic income? I don't know about the basic income about thing like that. I mean, that's we called it something else back in the day. Um, I do see it replacing some some jobs, things that are repetitive, things that you can you, you they have sort of defined parameters that you can come in those are that's already happening so like trash guys you know as soon as autonomous vehicles get a little bit better i you know like that role like there's a lot it of could be the driver but if you've looked in my neighborhood ain't nobody put their trash cans in the same place where they're supposed to all the time so as long as there's a human involved in the other part that's of it. That's where the robot comes in from. <laughs> uh, yeah i mean we're not the, the tesla not robot. everything is not everything is quite is progressive that there's still the human nature in there. Yeah. But yeah I, like they're, they're doing autonomous trucks on 130 where they're doing that in the driving. Um, but as long as there's a human element involved, which is very unpredictable and I don't have the ability to get real time. I mean, like two second old data is making a decision. That's rough. I can't fully do it. So I've still got somebody sitting in the cab doing this. So I'm still paying that person. To now hover over the wheel in case the AI goes out, right? Now, I think in a city or some other places where it's less risky, you have more control. I think you'll see more of that. But in the wide open spaces and stuff, I mean, you know, Ford's got Blue Cruise now where you can sort of leave it off and it does some basic lane assist. But you know the quality of the roads. You know, Stripe may be missing. It's using all that stuff to go do that. There's too many places for error where it, this costs people's lives. Yeah. So I think that's, you know, but, but there are areas, again, looking at things that are repetitive, that are fairly, if you don't do your job right, nobody dies. You know, those are areas where I would sort of be wary and look at what my next skill set could be. Are you moving into more speaking? I know, I know you <clears throat> play a role right now with the hmm? technology company. Hmm? Are you moving more into speaking eventually in the future or once you retire yeah, I, there? I, once I, you know, once I hang up corporate life, that's what I want to, I want to do that and do workshops where okay. again, I've taken sort of the form it's called Epic storytelling method. So I've got that. So you've created a system. Yeah. And Epic is, you know, emo, uh, uh, emotional. So the, the, each letter means something else, but how do you use that framework to sort of look at, and I think that was what you're asking for earlier to tell a story. Right? Got it. I, mean, I think adding personality types is a wonderful idea because that will definitely impact yeah, I can see a works. lot of companies yeah, using so, so, your service. Yeah, so, come so, in so and doing that because you've got technical sales folks out there. You've got these other people that need to learn yeah. the storytelling. Yeah, um, that would be the area. Yeah, uh, you know, I may tell, do some talks on Iron Man and stuff. You know, Iron Man training for the old fat guy or something. Who, you know, who knows? But um, yeah, I, again, because I like to give, and I look at it as, as more of fun time for my wife because there was a lot of travel and stuff when I was here. But where can I take her to go? you know, do something in Europe or go do something, you know, do something on the side to go do that. But I like meeting people. And are you actively like pursuing speaking opportunities? Yes. You yes. are. Yeah. Okay. And are you reaching out? Do you have somebody helping you with that? Or is it just through? I, yeah, I'm reaching out, um, you know, again, trying to do some stuff through my website. I'm doing some writing and stuff that way. It's just sort of the, the initial, the, the ball's just, you know, it's, it's a slow mass swim start right now. And I'm just sort of, Got it. I hadn't got a process in place because my day job, I dedicate every all the time I have to that. And this is sort of on the side, but I'm spending more time doing that at night and, you know, uh, writing things. I wrote something. Um, 
I did, I did a quick video on a story I wrote the other day, but yeah. You know, so yeah. Okay. I'm trying to get it out there where people see me in action. It makes it easier. It's sort of hard when you're doing a corporate event and it's localized to, Hey, can, Hey, I want tickets to go see Doug. He's like, hey. that doesn't <laughs> usually work very well. So, okay. Um, the, well, I guess we could wrap up on uh, time sake, hmm? time sake, your uh, story of your triathlon. So you did your first triathlon at f- some small podunk place in, in, in how, Iowa. You I were, mean, not Ohio, Ohio. And you were 40, 40. Well, the first Ironman I did was 47, but that 47. First, first triathlon, I was like in my thirties. Okay. I did it for a few years, retired the first time, came back the second time in my forties when we moved to Seattle. Okay. Um, and went into team and training and that's where we, we did an Olympic one. Um, my mentor at the time, he still has the best job title I've ever heard called Beer Ranger. Beer Ranger. Beer Ranger, uh, which was a route sales guy. And, they, and we were at an event. He says, hey, we need to do the Ironman. And I said, dude, I've, I've done a quarter of that distance. I'm not going to do that. Oh, here, have another beer. Yeah. Three beers later, it sounded like the best idea on the planet. We signed up for it. And six months later, I'm out doing an Ironman. And so the Ironman distances, can you tell me what they are? Sure. 2.4 mile swim. Okay. Uh, 112 mile bike ride. And then a full marathon. 26.2 miles and you start off with the swim or they yeah change? you start off with the swim because if you ended with a lot of people will drown so, <laughs> so, you, so you start off <laughs> that makes a lot of sense and, and it stretches the field out and stuff like that because it's easier sort of get now you know unfortunately there have been people drowned in a mass swim start but it's a lot less than if you got no gas left to go try to got do it. that got it so so your first uh iron man mm-hmm. what's going through your mind i hated my mentor <laughs> The beer ranger. You know, there was a lot of a lot of angst. Gonna say, what'd you get me into? Yeah, did um, he do it? Did he do it with you? Yeah, he did with me. Okay, good. Yeah, okay. And he finished a little bit before me. Uh, on that, he didn't pull the, the thing like your friend did, where he just ran it. He, he actually <laughs> beat me. Um, but you know, the environment there is really great. So, so we went over to court. It was in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. The first year they had that, I brought my wife over, and you know, you're preparing everything, your carbo loading or whatever for the like week before. Um, you get your special need bags together, which you can have one. So you have transition bags, one from swim to bike, one from bike to run. And then you have a special need bags halfway through the bike. So you can basically refill any drinks and stuff you had. Your nutrition, nutrition's always sort of a, will it work or not? And you go blank that out in the morning, you get marked. I mean, it's, you're sort of in your head going, okay, I'm got to compartmentalize this. I can get through one thing at a time. So I said, we're going to get through the swim. And I'd done that distance before. I was swimming across Lake Washington as, as part of the thing. So I'd done that distance before. I've had, and I have a wetsuit, so you know, I can always roll on my back like an otter and catch my breath. So I wasn't really worried. Swimming never really bothered me, other than the very first race I did. <clears throat> and then um, this, the horn goes off, the cannon goes off. I mean, they're playing like beautiful. I can still remember they played U, U, uh, U2's B- Beautiful Day. Um that morning, I can still see it. The sunrise is coming up, so you're you're getting pumped. They're talking, and you go out and you do the you do the start, and your mind's just simply in the okay. What's the next stroke? Where's the buoy? Where's these other things? For me, it's very compartmentalized. You you say, okay, look, that clown just climbed over me for the third time. I'm going to punch him in the face. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you just, it's, you're just climb. We used to train in a team and training. We used to do this one exercise where we'd put all the mentees over in the corner of a pool, take the lane lines down. Have them swim across, and then we were beating on them with pool noodles and stuff as they had to swim to this other side to sort of simulate the the thrashing that went on. Um, so you get through that, get on the bike. So that's pretty simple. I again, my, the transitions I was usually pretty fast on. You change clothes, get on the bike, go start riding and start eating and drinking, right? Because that's where you get most of your nutrition on that. Um, I'd always heard that at some point in time, you life started to suck. I didn't know it started to suck 20 minutes into the bike ride. Um, I, my bike seat was uncomfortable. My feet were burning. And it got to be 105 degrees during part of the bike ride. Um, I was just miserable, right? And, but I knew, okay, one mile at a time. Let's just keep going. And a little bit of the thing we were talking about earlier, okay, this guy just passed me. I've got to go past somebody else. You're sort of, you know, keeping track numbers and that. Doing, you're distracting yourself a lot. But you've got a lot of time in your head. The inner bully is very active during that time. And I mean, he's got endurance. He can, he can, he can hang, hang with you a long time. You're like, hey, you should just quit. You just go away. You just, I, I, so you try to focus yourself on something else. 
second lap um and my poor wife she can only see me every other lap you know it, it, when i come by and i have to sort of guess when i'm going to come by i really have no idea i haven't ridden the course before and so you know I, i'm having to worry about i'm worrying about her getting to see me you know making sure that hey i didn't die that you can follow people on the on the tracker yeah and i'm climbing up this hill it's about the 70 mile mark and i am literally falling asleep because i the drinks and stuff that i'd drink i couldn't drink they, they just tasted horrible um get to the top thank god for volunteers sits me down and says hey, how you feeling I, said, I don't feel so good I said, hey, that's odd you don't look so good either but here say so have a seat you gotta love a sense of humor um gave me a frozen banana i sat there contemplated life look again inner bully hey look you're an old fat guy you made it this far you're fine quit right save yourself other side can you live with quitting I'd never not finished a triathlon at that point in time before. I'd always finished what I had. Some were sucky, some were, I had flat tires, I had these other things, but I'd always done that. I said, I don't think I can. I don't think I can look back. And it was beyond triathlon, I'd never quit anything I started out to go do. Um, got back on the bike, rode, found out I got a second wind, um, was able to finish that. Then I got to the, you know, I got off the bike. I was never so happy to think about running 26 miles in my life but I could not sit on that seat any longer. <laughs> so, so I'm like, okay, I got six and a half hours to finish. And then it became a clock management because you have 17 hours to finish. So I said, okay, I'm going to run to the part where I know I can walk and run to get in. Just so I make, because I saw somebody, I saw two or three people pass out, like down to finish shoot that close. Wow. And they didn't make it. I said, that's not going to be me. You know, I've, wow. I've come too far. And so I, I, I got along and I did that. And, and, and I, they had, chicken broth at the aid station you think about it, that's disgusting who would think about chi- the best thing ever because you get sodium that comes in and makes it's warm sense and it does it and you can stomach it pretty well i was like keep me i was like three fisting it every time i got to an aid station i thought i was gonna od on chicken broth uh, but that was the calories i got in and i managed it came in and you get down to finishing straight and you're just coming in and it's like you know the crowd's just crying and, and you come through and you finish it and you hear that mike riley's his name says, Doug Thompson, you're an Iron Man. And so I heard that the first time, and I said, wow, I got that. And then, you know, I went back, and I couldn't sleep. You're just exhausted. I don't know if you ever gotten to the part where you're so exhausted you can't even sleep. You figured it'd be really easy. And the next morning, you know, I'm thinking about going up to sign up to do it again. <laughs> and next year, I didn't at that point. Don't you think about that. So it was a – I had that on my, you know, sort of like a TED thing. I said, I, I did an Iron Man. I did something that not a lot of people can do. That's awesome. I'm yeah. sure your kids are like. Well, they hey. call my bluff on it because I said, look, I'm sort of teasing myself. I'm going to get a tattoo after I get this done. So a few months later, after we finished this, my daughters got together. This is the first time they'd ever gotten together and give me a present in their life. Said, we're, we're going to pay for your tattoo. And I said, well, they called me on it. So I had to go. Get, I went down to a tattoo shop and I had to get a tattoo. And that hurt worse than the race. That's funny. Was getting the tattoo. I was like, because oh. I wanted to be still because I didn't want to. Yeah, you know, I have because oh, there's a check mark because I flinched on it. Yeah. Um, so they did that. They did the same thing for the second Iron Man. I finished till they got it. So I got two Iron Man. Do uh, they tattoos. do they have any aspirations of doing a an oh, Iron Man yeah, with you? No. no yeah. Now my my granddaughter, I have hopes for. She may be a swimmer. She likes that. But okay. yeah, no. Uh, Would you do another one? You know, my goal was to do, to outlive everybody in my age group. If I, I unfortunately I had to replace my knee uh, about seven months ago, so those things are out. Um, but you know, I, I, it's still in me. I still really like my, you know, I'm, I'll volunteer when I get a chance to go help others. Gotcha. Out. I would love to do it, but yeah, I don't want to be doing their knee replacement again. Cause that hurt worse than anything that I've had trying to recover from that. Yeah. My mom just got one done last week. Mm-hmm. Her, it, they redid it cause the cement wasn't done the first time. Ooh, yeah. Right. So, um, well, Doug, it's been great having you on. Yeah, I thanks think for having me. I think the question that you asked yourself, um, like I told you, my buddy uh, Zan okay, mm-hmm. was the one that got me to sign up for my first marathon and <laughs> after a couple of beers at a sushi place, right? Uh, beer ranger. You didn't have enough food to soak up the beer, so I was like, <laughs> you're really bad. We signed up. He's like, if you're going to do it, let's do it right now, yeah. you know? And uh, and um, anyways, the brutality on the, along the way, you know, the conversations that you're having with mm-hmm. yourself. I remember we're at the eighth mile, and you got a lot more to go still. Yeah. And uh, – uh, this, or we were at the halfway spot. It was right around there. And this guy's like, this little kid's outside. He was trying to encourage us. He was on his grass. And he was like, 
you're halfway there. <laughs> you know, and he meant to well, on the one hand, it's a good thing. On the other hand, yeah. Oh, I'm like, there. oh, that broke me mentally. I'm like, <laughs> I can barely move now, and I'm only halfway there. Oh, and man. at like mile, mile like 19 or 20, we were coming mm. up this hill. It's like the worst place to put a hill. It was like at mile 12 to like mile 19. We're coming up this hill, and I see these people, you know, with their their friends and their mm. family. And they were the ones that were like kind of keeping pace with us. Mm. And, um, and I'm like, man, they quit, you know? And they were mm-hmm. just like, hanging there. And I'm like, you guys are done. And he was like, yeah, you know, that was a lot for us. And I was like, you were so close. Yeah. You're so close to finishing. But that mm-hmm. question that you ask yourself, that's a question that I've asked myself in like so many years over the last two decades of doing business. Mm-hmm. You know, can you live with yourself if you quit? Right. And uh, it's great that you said, no, I can't, so I'm going to finish this. Yeah. And it's yeah. nice to meet somebody else that has that same sort of mindset. I can't, I can't quit. Yeah. Well, great to have you. Thanks a lot for having me. Yeah. Guys, hope you got some value, some great stories, some books. Uh, book out there, uh, Rattled Awake. Rattled Awake. Rattled Awake. And then there's going to be some more coming. And uh, look forward to seeing your next book when that comes out. And I will give you credit in that chapter. So I, I maybe you kind of, hey, look, is this sort of what you're thinking? I'll give you a little preview of that. Well, let's see. And, uh, man, great value. Thank you so much. Guys, we'll see you on the next one. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.